The Kingdom Hall of Jehovah's Witnesses in Cumming, Georgia. Justine and Gary LeClaire are among the congregants, and they are among the 1.2 million Jehovah's Witnesses in the United States. The organization of Jehovah's Witnesses was begun in the late 19th century by a small group of Bible students in Pennsylvania. We believe from the Bible that uh, God has a name and it is Jehovah, and that his son Jesus Christ is separate. His kingdom has been established in heaven, and instead of everybody going to heaven when they die, there'll actually be a resurrection here on the earth, and all our loved ones will come back and will enjoy perfect life forever right here on earth, where a lot of religions may teach things such as um, hellfire, immortality of the soul, and trinity. Uh, Jehovah's Witnesses don't believe those teachings. We take the Bible very literally and believe uh, the Bible for, for what it is. We look for the truth in the Bible. One of the truths witnesses believe in has to do with blood. In Genesis and again in Leviticus, there's very specific scriptures that state that the blood is sacred and that life is in the blood and that belongs to God. So we want to respect that and be obedient to that. So that means Jehovah's Witnesses do not accept blood transfusions. Mm -hmm. They believe to do so would be a sin, a sin serious enough that many church members would rather die than receive blood transfusions. This issue has been very much on the Leclerc's minds because in May, the 43-year-old Justine was about to have surgery. She had a tumor in her skull which had to be removed. For this type of surgery, most hospitals might have required a blood transfusion, which was unacceptable to Justine and to her husband Gary as well. It's her decision, obviously, but it'd make it a lot easier if she has support, and that's really my responsibility, and I'm taking it seriously. The Leclerc's found a solution to their problem in Englewood, New Jersey. Nearly 20 years ago, the Englewood Hospital began a bloodless surgery program. The policy grew out of the need of Jehovah's Witnesses, and now it has become the hospital's preferred method of surgery for all patients. You see this thing here? Yes. That's not supposed to be there. So this is a, a tumor of some kind, okay? Dr. Steinberger, who performed Justine's surgery, has become a firm believer in Englewood's avoidance of blood transfusions. For him, it's just good medicine. The science seemed very real. The, the uh, literature seemed to support it, and once uh, we started doing the operations, uh, the results were great. The risks of, of giving blood, in many cases, outweigh the benefits of giving blood. There are risks of infections. There are risks of lowering the immune response of the patient. There are risks of giving the wrong kind of blood. Errors can occur, and if there's any way to avoid getting a blood transfusion, one is better off in general if they can avoid it. In any sense, do you feel the Jehovah's Witnesses have done medicine a service? Definitely. They definitely have done medicine a service. You are not accepting blood, regardless of the circumstances. The key no to what, successful um, bloodless surgery is preparation. Sherry Ozawa directs the hospital's bloodless bad. surgery program. Many, many patients, estimates are as many as 40 or 50 percent of patients come to surgery anemic. They don't have enough blood cells. Very simply, dealing with that ahead of time, helping to build those patients' blood up, eliminates the, the, even the question of transfusion for many patients. We could perform even serious surgeries in even life-threatening situations bloodlessly with much greater success than other people would have expected, even than we expected initially. And there is the cost of blood. And it's immensely expensive. And if it's done for no good reason, that is billions of dollars of waste in the healthcare system. It costs about $1,100 to give one unit of blood, not to buy it, to transfuse one unit of blood. When Englewood's program began in 1994, there were fewer than 10 hospitals offering programs for surgery without blood transfusions. Today, there are about 150, and many more are in development. There is more to successful bloodless surgery than preparation. At Englewood, they practice precision surgery with minimal blood loss. 
And if a patient loses blood and has agreed beforehand, the surgeon uses a technology that recycles the patient's own blood. Still, there is a resistance among surgeons to bloodless surgery. Both Dr. Steinberger and Sherry Ozawa simply blame tradition and habit. The resistance is primarily behaviorally based. Physicians get um, about between three to six hours of training in transfusion science in medical school. They don't know a whole lot about it. So most of bloodless medicine or transfusion-free surgery really is education for clinicians and how to handle these situations without blood. Lately, doctors from other countries have taken an interest in bloodless surgery, particularly in Africa. They're learning the techniques that we have learned from taking care of this specific population to use in their countries where either the blood supply is unsafe or unavailable. Justine's surgery was successfully performed on May 9th. She went home to Georgia two days later. Everything went very well, no problems. Uh, she's waking up from anesthesia. There was hardly any blood loss, and depending on how she feels tomorrow, she can leave when she feels ready to go. You did a wonderful thing. Well, let's, let's see how she does after. Yeah. For Religion and Ethics News Weekly, I'm Betty Rollin in Englewood, New Jersey.